This lecture is part of an online course about Lie groups and we'll be discussing the question of the relation between Lie groups and Lie algebras. So in the previous lecture we showed that if you're given a Lie group you can get a Lie algebra. And the question is how much of the Lie group does its Lie algebra actually capture? So for example we can ask the following questions. Um, if two groups um, G and H have the same Lie algebra or at least isomorphic Lie algebras are they isomorphic? In other words, does the Lie algebra determine the Lie group? And we will see the answer to this is no. Um, secondly, if we've got two groups G and H, suppose we've got a homomorphism from G to H, then it's easy to check that you get a homomorphism from the Lie algebra of G to the Lie algebra of H. Um, I mean, it maps the tangent space of the identity of G to the tangent space of the identity of H, and it's not difficult to check this preserves the Lie bracket. And we can ask, is the converse true? So let's put a question mark there. If we've got a homomorphism between Lie algebras of Lie groups, does this give us a homomorphism between the Lie groups? And the answer is, in general, no. Or suppose special case of this, suppose G is a subgroup of H, then the Lie algebra of G is a subalgebra of the Lie algebra of H. We can ask, is the converse true? So if um, we have a um, Lie algebra that's contained in the Lie algebra of H, does it come from some closed subgroup. I guess I should have said here G is a closed subgroup of H. Um, Non-closed subgroups can be very weird and generally when you talk about a subgroup you're very often talking about a closed subgroup. Not always. but And the fourth question we can ask, does any Lie algebra come from a Lie group. So um, in, in, in this lecture we're implicitly assuming that all Lie groups and Lie algebras are finite dimensional. The infinite dimensional case gets a lot trickier. Um, I think I forgot to say the answer to this question three is no and the answer to question four actually turns out to be yes for once. So what we're going to do is, is going to go through and give some examples to sort of illustrate what's going on. So the first question, you remember, said that if two Lie groups have the same Lie algebra, are they isomorphic? Well, this is obviously false because G has the same Lie algebra as its connected component. So in general, if a group isn't connected, there will be a connected group with the same Lie algebra and the groups aren't isomorphic. But we should ask the question for connected groups. So suppose G and H are connected and have the same Lie algebra, which is a sloppy way of saying their Lie algebras are isomorphic. Um, well, are they the same? Well, no, because we can do things like we can take the reals maps onto the circle group S1 and these both of Lie algebras isomorphic to the reals. Um, um, another example might be the group SL2 of R maps onto the group PSL2 of R and the kernel is consists of the elements plus or minus one. And again, these two groups have the same Lie algebra, but they're not isomorphic. For instance, this one has a non-trivial center and this one doesn't. Um, and um, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, um, what's going on is that these pairs of groups are locally isomorphic. So that, that there's a neighborhood of the identity of this group that looks like a neighborhood of the identity of this group 
and if two groups are locally isomorphic they have the same Lie algebra so locally isomorphic implies the same Lie algebra in fact the converse is also true if two groups have the same Lie algebra they are at least locally isomorphic but this this takes a bit more work so I'm not going to cover it this lecture um, and you can get lots of examples of locally isomorphic groups by taking G modulo a discrete um, closed subgroup. Um, so that's what's going on in these two examples here. The discrete closed subgroup is the integers and here it's just plus or minus one. And if you mod out by a discrete closed subgroup you're obviously going to get a locally isomorphic group because this doesn't affect what's going on near the identity. Um, so um, in, in fact discrete closed subgroups of G are quite restricted so suppose G is connected um, then any normal discrete subgroup is in the center of G so in particular it has to be abelian and you can see this as follows. So, so let's fix some gamma in this closed normal subgroup. Let's call this closed normal subgroup gamma. And we look at the map taking G to the commutator, G to the minus 1 gamma to the minus 1 G gamma. And you notice the image is in gamma because we can write this as G to the minus 1 gamma minus 1 g and this is in gamma because gamma is normal and then we're multiplying it by gamma which is also in gamma. So um, here we've got a map from g to gamma and um, g is connected and gamma is discrete so the image is a single point. On the other hand if we take g to be the identity then this is the identity so the image um, must actually be the identity of um, g. Well that just means that little g commutes with gamma for all g so, so any normal discrete subgroup must actually be in the center so the, the normal discrete subgroups we're quotienting out by here I guess that should have been normal are actually quite restricted. Um, well, so let's have a look at the, the next question, which says that um, you remember if we've got a homomorphism of groups, then this gives rise to a homomorphism from the Lie algebra of G to the Lie algebra of H. And we want to know is the converse true? And again, the answer is no. So here we've got a homomorphism of groups from R to S1. And if we look at the Lie algebra, it's just R to R and this is actually an isomorphism. So there's an isomorphism of Lie algebras back the other way but there's no homomorphism of groups from S1 to R corresponding to this. Um, well what's going on here is that this group here S1 is not simply connected. So we recall that simply connected means that any loop inside the group can be sort of contracted down to um, a single point if it, provided you keep a, a sort of point fixed. Um, in other words we can take a loop and sort of pull it down like that. And obviously the real line is simply connected if you've got any loop, in other words the image of a, of a circle in the real line it sort of might look something like this and you can obviously just contract it down. On the other hand if you've got the circle group S1 there's a pretty obvious loop that just goes round S1 that you can't contract down. And it turns out that if G is simply connected then um, a map from Lie, Lie algebra of G to the Lie algebra of H um, induces a homomorphism from G to H. Um, again we don't really have enough um, technology to prove this quite yet. 
Um, but as I said, this lecture is just giving a few examples. So the third question says that suppose G, so suppose we've got a Lie algebra contained in the Lie algebra of um, a subgroup of a group H. Um, is there a, we can ask, is there a closed subgroup corresponding to L? And the answer is not quite. Um, we have the following funny example. Let's take G to be a, a product of two copies of S1, which is just R you can think of as R2 modulo the lattice Z2. And what I'm going to do is to take L to be the multiples of X alpha X beta for X in R, where alpha over beta is irrational. And we can think of G as being a sort of square with the top and bottom identified. So um, what you should do is you should think of the top of this as being identified with the bottom and the left hand side identified with the right hand side. And now if we try finding a, a subgroup corresponding to L, we can find such a subgroup. It's, it's just the subgroup of all multiples of alpha and beta. And, and the subgroup sort of looks like this. Um, well, it comes up there and then it comes up there and it sort of goes on like this. And the problem is the subgroup of all points of the form x alpha x beta is dense in G. So it's not closed. And so in some sense we do get a subgroup, but if a subgroup isn't closed inside a group, then um, you, you run into sort of funny problems trying to take its Lie algebra. So there's sort of a subgroup corresponding to, to this subalgebra, but you have to be a little bit careful about it. Um, finally, um, if we can ask the fourth question says that um, does any Lie algebra come from a Lie group? Again, we're doing the finite dimensional case. And here the answer is yes, but it's actually a little bit tricky to prove. Um, let, let me say a bit about how to prove an, the, the easy case where the center of the Lie algebra L is um, is just zero. So what's the center of a Lie algebra? Well, the center is the set of of a group. It's the set of group elements that commute with everything else. Uh, for Lie algebras, commuting with something corresponds to the Lie bracket being zero. So this would say that x y equals naught for all y, or rather the set of x such that x y equals zero for all y. Um, and if the center of L is non-zero, then, um, then L can be then written as a, a sub, sorry, a sub Lie algebra at the n by n matrices over R, where n is equal to the dimension of L. And we do this by actually identifying L with, with n by n matrices. So linear transformations of L um, correspond to elements of this, this Lie algebra. And um, what, we, what we want to do is to get a map taking from each element of L to some linear transformation of L. And this, this, this will give us a map from L to the, the Lie algebra of GLN. Let's call this map rho. And um, um, rho of an element A is the linear transformation such that rho A of B is equal to A B. Um, and we need to check that this is a homomorphism of Lie algebra. So we want rho A B to be rho A rho B minus rho B rho A. Um, 
Well, in order to check this, we need to see that ABC is equal to ABC um, minus BAC. And this sort of looks more or less like the Jacobi identity with possibly a few signs. And these signs come from the fact that you sometimes switch the orders of A and B. So this follows from the Jacobi identity and anti-symmetry. So this gives one interpretation of what the Jacobi identity is. It's saying the natural action of L on itself is actually a homomorphism of L to the Lie algebra of n by n matrices. Um, now, um, now, now we've got L as a subalgebra of n by n matrices, and you can show from this that L actually corresponds to a subgroup, although doing that, um, well, you need to use something like the exponential map that we'll be covering in a later lecture, so I'll postpone this for the moment. Um, you notice um, the fact that L is a subalgebra of M and L follows from the fact that the center is equal to zero, because anything in the center of L would have image zero under this map here. So that, that's why we need the center of L to be zero for this easy proof. If the center of L isn't zero, then it's still true that L is a subalgebra of some uh, uh, of the algebra of n by n matrices, but it's rather more difficult to prove. Again, we might do that in a later lecture. So, um, let's have a summary. Um, so we've seen that Lie algebras don't quite correspond to Lie groups because there are the various problems. However, um, Lie algebras are very similar to simply connected Lie groups. So we saw that most of the problems that arose that that, 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 that Lie groups not quite correspond to Lie algebras we're related to the fact the group was either not connected or not simply connected. So what I'm going to do now is to say a little bit about the relation between um, um, Lie groups and simply connected Lie groups. Well, if the group isn't connected, then the, 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 the group of components can be any discrete group and we can't really say much about that. So what we're really going to do is compare connected groups to simply connected groups. So in other words, suppose we had somehow managed to understand all the simply connected groups. How can we find all the connected groups from that? Um, well, as we said, if we've got a, a simply connected group, then um, we can form another group by taking the quotient of G by gamma, where gamma is discrete and normal. And as we saw earlier, this implies that it's actually in the center of G. Um, and this is now a connected um, Lie group. And we can do the converse. If we've got any connected Lie group, we can actually construct a simply connected Lie group such that our connected group is a quotient of this. And I'll just recall how to do this. So suppose H is a connected group. We put G to be the universal cover of H. And let's recall from algebraic topology what this consists of. So we, we fix the identity E is a base point of H. And G is the set of all homotopy classes of paths um, in H starting at E. This means a map F from the unit interval to H with F of zero equals E. So um, if we've got a group H like this and point E, then a typical path would be um, 
some path like that. As I said, these are homotopy classes of paths. These are homotopy classes um, fixing F0 and F1. So what we do is, is we take the path and, it, and we fix the beginning and end of the path and we're allowed to move the path provided we keep the um, start and end points fixed. So, so this um, path here is considered to be homotopic to this path here and these are all going to represent the same element of the universal cover. And the basic result of algebraic topology that this universal cover is simply connected and it's also a group. Um, so in order to see it's a group let's just take H and if we've got some path starting at E going to some point here and some other path going to some other point, so this goes to a point G and this orange path might go to a point H. We can sort of just shift uh, the path going to H by um, multiplying it by G everywhere. We take every point of this path and multiply it by G. So this now goes to a point um, GH. And you can easily check that this is a well-defined operation and in fact gives you a group structure on the universal covering space. And furthermore, this group is locally isomorphic to H, sorry, to G. Um, again, this is a general result from um, algebraic topology and works for any space. It's nothing to do with being a group. So we've got a map from um, a simply connected group onto our group G which is a, a local isomorphism. So these have the same Lie algebra but this group here is simply connected. Um, um, incidentally um, um, the um, uh, the, the, the group we quotient out by is actually, you can check it's actually isomorphic to the fundamental group pi 1 of the group G we started with. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, a, a discrete normal subgroup like this here has to be abelian, so this sort of suggests the slightly surprising result that the fundamental group of any Lie group is always abelian. Um, in fact, you can check this directly as follows. So suppose we've got two elements of the fundamental group of G. So um, an element of the fundamental group of G will be a, a path from the, the unit interval to the group G. Um, such that the image of the beginning and end of the path are both the identity of G. So suppose we take one element of the fundamental group and we take another element of the fundamental group. So this will now give us a map um, H mapping to G and again the images of the beginning and end of the path will be in G. Now we can compose these two paths in two different ways. Um, so we can multiply this element of the fundamental group by this element or we can do them in the other order. And in order to show that the fundamental group is a boolean, we've got to show that these two maps are homotopic. In other words, we've got to kind of fill in this square here, which will give us a homotopy between this path in G and this path in G. And that's quite easy because um, we can just map any point x, y in this square to h of x times f of y where we multiply these two elements in the group. Um, in fact you can see in order for this argument to work we don't actually need g to be a group we just need it to have a nice um, continuous product with an identity element. So fundamental groups of Lie groups are particularly easy to deal with because they're abelian. So anyway let's see some examples of this. 
Well, the simple example is one we've had before. If we take G to be the circle group S1, then its universal covering space is just the reals, which sort of sits over it in a sort of um, helical pattern. Um, like this and so on. So this would be a copy of R mapping to S1. And the fundamental group of a circle is of course just C. And you can see the kernel of this map from the reals to the group S1 is again just isomorphic to Z. Um, well, for a more interesting example, let's look at the general linear group in two variables over the reals. And we want to know what is the group of components and what is the fundamental group pi 1. And to do this, we recall the Gram-Schmidt process, which is sometimes called the Iwasawa decomposition. Iwasawa decomposition is something that works for more general groups. So the Gram-Schmidt process, you remember, um, is a way of turning any base of R2 into an orthonormal base. And um, the Iwasawa decomposition writes the group as a product of a certain compact subgroup and a certain abelian subgroup and a certain nilpotent subgroup. And in these three cases, the nilpotent subgroup is going to be these matrices and the abelian subgroup is going to be these matrices with diagonal entries greater than zero and the compact subgroup is just going to be the group of orthogonal matrices. And you can see that writing GL2 of R as a product of these three groups is really the Gram-Schmidt process because multiplying something by this nilpotent subgroup is really making a base orthogonal by adding a multiple of one vector to another. Then multiplying the base by this diagonal matrix is just multiplying each basis vector by a positive real which you can, by which, which you can use to make the matrix, sorry, to make the basis all have norm one. And finally what we're left with is an orthonormal base and any two orthonormal bases are related by a unique orthogonal rotation. So it's a, a, an element of the orthogonal group. So the Gram-Schmidt process is just a way of saying that every element of the GL2 of R can be written uniquely in this form. And now we can figure out what the fundamental group is because these two spaces are both contractible. Um, so in fact, the, this is isomorphic to the reals and this is isomorphic to the product of two copies of the positive reals and they're both contractible. So the components and the fundamental group of the general linear group are the same as the components and the fundamental group of the two-dimensional orthogonal group. And this is much easier to work out because the orthogonal group of R has two components, one of which is SO2 of R which is just the rotations, and the other is the reflections of R2. So, so we've got two components. We can also work out the fundamental group. Well, let, let, let's just notice that the, 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 the group of components of GL2 of R, which is usually noted by pi zero, is just isomorphic to Z modulo 2Z, so it's order two. And pi 1 of GL2 of R is isomorphic to pi 1 of SO2 of R. Well, the group of rotations of R2 is just isomorphic to a circle. So this is just the fundamental group of a circle, which is isomorphic to Z. So the fundamental group of GL2 of R is actually Z. So we have a simply connected group Let's call this GL2 of R plus and put a twiddle over it. So this means you take the identity component and this means you take the universal cover. And this maps to GL2 of R and the quotient is 
um, a group of order 2 and the kernel of this map is z. Um, and it's kind of really quite difficult to describe GL2 of the universal cover of GL2 of R in terms of matrices. The problem is um, this is not isomorphic to a group of matrices. In fact, we will see later when we look at the representation theory of GL2 of R plus that any um, map of this group on a finite dimensional vector space um, must vanish on, on this kernel z, so it really factors through gl2 of z. So, so this group is kind of hard to get hold of. You, you can't write down explicit matrices for it, at least not in finite dimensions. You, you can if you allow infinite matrices. Um, similarly, um, the, 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 the group sl2 of r also has a universal cover um, with an infinite center z. Um, and um, these, these covers are also a bit mysterious. The only one that I've ever seen turn up anywhere is the so-called metaplectic group, where you take the double cover of SL2Z. So you, 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 you can take a cover with fundamental group Z, but you can then quotient out by 2Z and get a, get a group that's just a double cover. And this double cover of SL2Z actually turns up in the theory of modular forms. It's very closely related to modular forms of half integral weight. But again, it has no faithful finite dimensional representation, so it's a little bit tricky to handle. Um, so um, that's looked at the fundamental group of GL2. Now let's take a look at the fundamental group of GL3 of R. Well, as before, it has the same um, group of components and the same fundamental group as O3 of R. We can again do the Gram-Schmidt process and see that GL3 of R is homotopy equivalent to the, the orthogonal group O3 of R. Um, so O3 of R has a subgroup SO3 of R, the special orthogonal group of things of determinant plus 1 of index 2. So pi 0 of GL3 of R is pi 0 of O3 of R, which is a group of order 2. So it has two components, which are, of course, the matrices of positive determinant and the matrices of negative determinant. Pi 1 of GL3 of R is isomorphic to pi 1 of um, SO3 of R, because we can, we, we, we can forget about the um, the other component. And this pi 1 of SO3 of R is not at all obvious. It turns out to be um, a, another group of order 2. Um, one way to see this is to use quaternions. So you recall that quaternions are the group of uh, uh, um, are, are the ring of all matrices A plus BI plus CJ plus DK. And it has a, the multiplicative group has a subgroup S3, which is the set of A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, such that A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared equals 1. So obviously a sphere. And this is a group, and it maps onto the group SO3 of R. And the way it does this is we can think of SO3R as being the rotations of the vector space bi plus cj plus dk. And the way s3 acts as rotations is if we've got some quaternion g here, um, it acts on a, on a vector v as g of v is gvg to the minus 1, where, where 
this vector is g. So we can define a homomorphism from the group S3 to rotations of three-dimensional space. You can easily check that its image does in fact preserve the obvious um, quadratic form. And the kernel of this map is just the matrices plus or minus one. So what we've got is um, we see that the group S3 is a double cover of SO3 of R. And the group S3 is, of course, simply connected And so the fundamental group of SO3 is the kernel of the map from its simply connected cover, which is just a group of order two. So you see that the um, fundamental groups of um, Lie groups can sometimes be a little bit surprising. I mean, you probably wouldn't guess if you didn't know that the fundamental group of GL3 was Z2 and the fundamental group of GL2 was the integers. Um, so. Um, by the way, the, the fact that the fundamental group of orthogonal groups often has order 2 um, um, is, a, is a special case of the construction of spinner groups that we'll be doing later. And in fact, S3 is the, one of the simplest examples of, of a spin group. OK, um, so next lecture we will be discussing the exponential map that gives uh, another relation between the Lie algebra and the Lie group.